Merry Christmas, everybody! Good morning, welcome back to Vlogmas episode, oh gosh I don't even know, I haven't edited the last one yet, 15, 16, <laughs> one of the two, it's Christmas Eve, Eve, I hope you're all doing well, I am okay, <laughs> I've got to be honest with you, I'm not feeling the, the merriest <laughs> at the moment, I, uh, like yesterday was okay and it was like fine, but I did find myself feeling a little bit like just over it by the end of the day. And when my husband came home, I kind of was talking to him and trying to like figure out why I'm feeling low. And I, I think it's because normally my husband would have finished work by now, like days and days ago, because normally we make an effort to save up his holiday so that he can have like basically most of December off. But that didn't happen this year, obviously, because of his change in job. I'm just not feeling festive, honestly. It doesn't feel like it's Christmas Eve tomorrow. Like, in all honesty, it's raining, it's dreary, the house is a bit of a mess. I just... <laughs> I'm just not feeling it, so... I wanted to share that because I know I won't be the only one. I feel maybe there's partly a pressure to feel festive at this at this time and I think doing Vlogmas as well, I definitely put a pressure on myself to be all like, yay, Merry Christmas, but it's like they know. Anyway, yes, I know I'm not the only one that is probably not feeling that festive and I just wanted to say it out loud to make myself feel better and to reassure you that, you know, it's all right if you're not like, yay, it's Christmas. It's weird because I've been like looking forward to Christmas since like August. <laughs> and maybe I've christmas myself out. Maybe I put pressure on myself. I don't know. But either way, I'm just not really feeling it today. Um, I'm hoping that tomorrow when my husband's officially finished work and we're at my sister's for our like family party that I'll start to get the feels. But I'm definitely looking forward to the break between Christmas and New Year more than I ever have, I think. I also think I need to address the elephant in the room and say that I'm not currently getting any joy from my knitting. And that's normally one of my biggest sources of comfort and joy. <laughs> Lol, Christmas. Um, but obviously I'm just getting like no joy from that <laughs> at the moment and I know it's completely self-imposed and I could just like stop now but I know that I think I'll feel worse if I don't get as much done before Christmas as I can. I've got a couple of inches on my second sleeve and it's my goal today to finish that sleeve and then I'm going to wrap it either tonight or tomorrow morning whatever it is and I'm just going to be done because really, you know, I'm not going to finish it on Christmas Eve, am I? I've got too much other stuff to do. So I'm just going to write off Christmas Eve for working on my husband's cardigan and just, you know, leave it. <laughs> I'm going to wrap it when I finish the sleeve and be done with it. And I think I'm going to cast on a hat for Penny. I mentioned before I've got some beautiful... Um, hand dyed DK. Let me go and get it actually. 
here it is it's called sleigh ride i think which is fitting because that's my favorite christmas song by biff sugar yarns and it's their um 75 20 waff 20 waff <laughs> 25 i was thinking about super wash and it came out as 20 waff <laughs> 75 25 super wash merino nylon dk weight so it's technically a sock yarn but i like to use this for a hat for penny because the hat will get ruined and i like to be able to stick it in the wash i say hat i'm actually going to make her a bonnet i'm going to make the hector's bonnet by rust knitwear which is a brand new release i was very close to like putting my name in the hat to testing it but i didn't want to give myself that extra pressure and i thought well you know i'm gonna wait so here we go let me give you a little close-up i think when it comes to hand dyed yarn i definitely prefer like a a lot of white with speckly color on it obviously when i wind this up it might look completely different i think it'll probably look quite pinky purple overall but i think this is going to be beautiful so the bonnet that i'm going to make it goes up to three to four so she should be able to fit that last size and it's done in garter stitch and with short rows and it's like hello <laughs> my perfect kind of therapy um according to the yardage i might be a little bit short however this i've just weighed this and this is 110 grams not 100 grams so i need to do the maths and i might just about have enough however if i don't have enough i feel like i should have enough for the main bonnet and then i could do like the eye cord edging and the like the little ties in a different color it doesn't really matter i don't really mind like penny's gonna love this when she sees this and i'm so excited to work on this and to get some color in my life i am so sick of brown <laughs> yes My smoothie, by the way, is mainly banana and peanut butter because that's my favourite kind of smoothie. Some frozen mango to make it cold and a little bit of sweetness. Some milk, some chia seeds, some protein powder. I normally quite like to put spinach in it as well, but I don't have any at the moment because I only really like spinach in smoothies. I don't like eating it cooked. Don't mind it raw in a salad, but um, it takes up a lot of space in the fridge, so I don't have any at the moment. But yeah, I do... I do like a banana peanut butter smoothie when I... So when I'm feeling a bit low like this, one of the first things that happens is I don't eat. Like, it's, I think it's kind of like a, a, a reaction that's so deeply ingrained in me that it's very difficult to, like, kick. So the idea of making food, eating food at the moment, like, my, my brain just doesn't want to do it. So I found that having a smoothie is the best way for me to make sure I'm getting some nutrients in the day and some fuel and some calories but I just don't have to think about it I can just put everything I need in a glass blend it up and like drink it <laughs> so that's another thing if you're struggling with that kind of issue at this time of year as I know a lot of you do then get on the old smoothies and it just tastes yummy tastes so good like is there a better flavour combination than peanut butter and banana? I challenge you to give me a better flavour combination. Let me know in the comments. <laughs> so, um, I went to Pilates this morning. Another thing that I me and my husband talked about last night is how I'm feeling like quite disconnected with my body. I'm feeling like I need some like headspace time alone fit it in when we can and because he's working from home today he had no zoom calls this morning so that meant i could go to a class and i'm i'm kind of glad that i did it was a good class it was all on the floor it was a lot of core poem and like physically it felt really really good i was a little bit thrown at first because i was right next to the mirror it was a really busy class i got there five minutes early I still didn't get a spot away from the mirror however i managed to just not face the mirror at any point like i've been in classes before where the instructor tells you to face the mirror and like look at yourself and look at your form and check your positions and stuff and i just cannot but this time i managed to like you do one side and then instead of turning over I like flipped over so I could do the other side if that makes any sense so yeah I feel all right I did cry at the end during the breathing but that usually happens whether I'm happy or sad it's just something that my body does it's like the release the stretching the opening it's just something that happens like not every time but if I am already feeling a bit sad it tends to happen then anyway but I'm kind of not too worried about that happening in classes now because I know it's quite 
common thing. It happens to lots of people for lots of different reasons. So um, I did have a little cry. <laughs> and if anything, that tends to make me feel a bit better anyway. So I'm doing what I can today to kind of battle the the lowness. I'm not going to stress today about the house, something else I've chosen. And I think that's because tomorrow morning, my husband and I together will do the big pre-Christmas blitz. So I'm not going to... Oh, someone's at the bloody door now. <laughs> okay, it was my plan today to do a Q&A. I did a Q&A on Instagram the other day in my story, but all the re all the responses have gone. I, I assumed that they would be saved within my in my archive like the post was, but the responses aren't there anymore. So if you did ask me a question on Instagram, I'm really, really sorry that I'm not going to be able to answer it. Major, major fail. I do, however, remember that a lot of the questions were to do with designing, and a lot were to do with my autism and stuff. So I think I can remember a few of them and I'm gonna do my best to kind of have a little chat about it. And I'm gonna start with designing. Most of the questions were along the lines of how did you start designing? How did you get the confidence to start designing? What did you do? How did you learn? All this kind of stuff. And I've been thinking quite a lot about it. And actually my kind of designing was there like right from the beginning of learning to knit. I was from the very start, like trying things out, casting things on following a pattern for a few bits and then having to go myself I remember I made quite a few baby bonnets to start with because I was pregnant with Penny my friend was also pregnant and she was having a baby so I self-drafted a bonnet it didn't fit the baby at all <laughs> but I just remember thinking well I like this stitch pattern and I've done this construction let's smush them together and see what happens and then I did the same with a jumper for my son I think I had made the flax by tin can knits and then I had a go at drafting my own kind of um sweater for him I'm pretty sure it was like a a, a top it was like a um a drop shoulder I can't remember if I worked it bottom up maybe I think it was bottom up but I remember the first time I did it yeah it was definitely bottom up because the first time I did it I couldn't I couldn't get it over his head, the neck hole was too small, so I ended up undoing the shoulder seam and putting in like a button placket that was backwards, and I think it was chunky yarn, but I'd used like two small needles, so the gauge was really, really tight, and it was thick and stiff and bulky, but I loved it, and I'm pretty sure if I can find a picture of him in it, I will put one in, I don't know if I have one or not though. Um, so it was just like trying, just having a go, not expecting too much of yourself. I wasn't like designing for the intention of being a designer at the time. I was just having fun with it. And then... Mommy, we bought her hairs and toes and top and hats. Oh no, do you need a kiss? <laughs> Come on, let's, let's try and look like a normal family for once. <laughs> So then we got to the corner set socks and something just felt different and I was like, I wanna give this an actual go. I think I can do this. I think I know enough about socks. I think I know enough about what I wanna say and how I wanna say it. So I did it. I didn't have a proper tech editor at the time, but it was fully tested and my sister, who's a graphic designer, checked all my spelling, my formatting, all that kind of thing. She also branded Penrose Knits for me at the time, which was amazing. And I just, I just really enjoyed the process. And I'd probably say my next kind of milestone as a designer was the souffle, of course. I knew that that one from the very start, I knew. I just knew that it was the one. I knew it was the first garment because I had kind of mucked about with a few garments beforehand, but none of them had really kind of hit with me. But the souffle was the one and I think that was reflected because it did really well and I'm so, so proud of it. Um, I think somebody asked me what my favorite of my designs was and it has to be the souffle, really. It has to be. I feel like it's like, it's the most synonymous with Penrose Knits, and it's the one that, like, it was just, it was just the one, wasn't it? And I love it so much. I haven't actually worn it for quite a while. Um, I have found that once I get a design done and out there, I'm, like, over it, and I don't really have much desire to wear them. Um, but I feel like that will that will fade. The only, time, the only thing that hasn't happened with actually is the eclair. <laughs> I wear that all the time and I've got a similar feeling about the eclair that I do about the, the souffle. It just feels like the one. My testers are doing so well on that by the way. We've got a couple of people who've already reached the sleeve split and I'm like wow. There are a couple of versions without bobbles and I love them. OMG. So nice. So my advice to you if you want to start designing is just to give it a go. 
don't put any pressure on yourself don't think about releasing it don't think about sales or anything like that just have a go see if you enjoy it and then if you do get to the point where you would want to release a pattern I would say do everything you can to get yourself a tech editor now I know that financially that's not possible for everyone but if you are serious about wanting to be a knitwear designer then you've kind of got to start you've got to kind of set your standards with the first one if you release a pattern that's full of typos and bad maths and people aren't going to come back to you whereas if you release a pattern that is you've put as much of the work in as possible and that you can't, you can't release, you can't edit your own work. Even a tech editor won't edit their own patterns because you get a lot of people who do everything, who um, design, who grade, who tech edit. Even they wouldn't tech edit their own patterns. And it's such an important part of the process. Um, at the very least, get some testing. At the very least, get proofreading. Do everything you can um, to make it perfect and then to be honest once you get that first one out of the way the ones afterwards are much easier because you kind of have your like template really and you learn a lot I learned so much from the souffle like so so much there must have been like 10 15 edits of the souffle before it even got to testing but then the next ones after that were so quick three or four edits maximum even the eclair which was honestly the hardest thing I've ever written in my life um, even that only had a few edits really before we got to testing phase so if you want to design just have a go and do your best to do it you've got to put the work in I think you can't half ass it you've really got to commit and do it because if you want your patterns to stand out then they need to be good high quality patterns it's not even necessarily I don't think about the pattern itself like for god's sake the penny gloves like they're the most simple things in the world but the pattern's done so well because I think, you know, the name attached to it, of course, but you know what you're getting with a petite knit pattern. You know that the quality of the pattern is going to be perfect and worth that money you're spending. You know, even the most like basic, simple looking garments, if you've got a pattern that is badly written, you're not going to go back to that designer. Like, even if the pattern's free, I don't think. Whereas if you've got some, if you've got a design that's, you know, basic or whatever and or something that's like quite a common thing but the pattern is written in a way that you enjoy following that works for you I know that's a very personal thing I personally cannot handle a pattern that's 50 pages long that's got paragraphs and paragraphs before you even get to the start which is why I like petite knit patterns but I do also understand that a lot of people do like that so with my own patterns I try to find the balance I try to give all the information that you need but in a succinct way and I try and keep it so that the pattern itself is there and easily brought in and all that extra information doesn't overtake from that pattern so I'll, I'll give you all the need to knows before you start but all your like techniques and your extra stuff is all at the end of the pattern because those of you who don't need it then don't have to read through it before you start through fear of missing something but those of you who do need it have access to it if you need to um I also hate scrolling <laughs> if, I'm on a, if I open a pattern I want to be like right okay open the pattern page one go I don't want to be like okay here we go <laughs> Okay, that's just me. That's weird. I don't know why we've got onto that. I've been chatting so much that my yellow smoothie's gone brown and it's now room temperature and it's not as nice as it was five minutes ago. Five minutes ago? Who am I kidding? 15 minutes ago. So if you have any more questions about designing, feel free to ask them in the comments below. I won't profess to be an expert. I've only been doing it for a year or so, really. But I have learned a lot in that year and I've learned from some amazing people. I'm so, so lucky to have found my tech editor who's not just edited my patterns she's been my teacher she's like held my hand this whole year and she's amazing like no question is too small for her i've also got some you know really amazing friends who also design sophie of the knit pearl girl like she's been a constant form of like um reassurance and encouragement and like she's answered so many of my questions and i've learned so much from knitting her patterns and everything so surround yourself with wonderful people and you'll be fine <laughs> this is like a fancy dress thing that people do right they make crowns out of skeins i think that suits me <laughs> Seeking us to warm up air.
the evening segment with me, Laura, of Penrose Knits. Featuring a big old pile of washing. <laughs> Funnily enough, the washing is the only thing that's not stressing me out at the moment. It's been an okay afternoon. Full transparency. I've been under the cloud today. And there'll be plenty of you out there that understand what I mean by that. And <laughs> some of you who don't. Sometimes you just feel like there's this thing hanging over you and everything feels darker and harder and you can't explain it, <laughs> which is frustrating. But I'm getting better at coping with that. So I plugged myself into my headphones and I decided to tackle some cleaning. I decided to stop putting it off till tomorrow and just, you know, get going with it. I prioritised the kitchen because that's our most used space. And then I did the rooms that usually get left till last, like the kids' bedroom, our bedroom, um, all that kind of thing. So that tomorrow morning when we kind of do like the living room deep clean, we haven't got those kind of funny little spaces that get left over and I end up with like a, you know, going to sleep in a messy bedroom on Christmas day, which, you know, isn't the nicest for me so I've had some cleaning therapy and then I had a bath which for me is a really important form of self-care I know a lot of the time having a bubble bath isn't real self-care gets put around a lot and I do think that self-care comes from a much comes from a very deep place and it's very personal and but for me when I'm overwhelmed and when I'm over and when I'm when I have sensory overwhelm in particular a bath is something that's a really useful tool for me because it it like it's basically like sensory deprivation it's warm it's dark it's quiet I'm in control of what I'm listening to what I'm looking at I have the feeling of being clean, I have like weightlessness and it just kind of ticks all the boxes for me and really helps me just kind of recenter. I wouldn't even call it relaxing because it's not like I'm lying in the bath for hours, like I've got stuff to do, I wash my hair, wash my face, all this stuff. So it's definitely about the sensory deprivation for me and I've only re really recently learned that about myself. Speaking of which, my husband has currently gone for a float. He likes, he enjoys um, float therapy. It's something that we did together. I got him a voucher for it for either Christmas, I think it must have been Christmas last year or birthday or something, but basically there's a big pod full of salty water, no light, no sound, no nothing. It's like complete sensory deprivation. Obviously you think, wow, that sounds amazing for you, Laura. I fricking hated it <laughs> it was like the opposite of sensory deprivation for me like my front was dry my back was wet no I was bobbing around and every time I hit the side it was like no I could hear things like at the front of the shop my pod was like the first room I should have been right in the back because I could hear people coming in and out and I couldn't get comfortable and I just wanted to like turn it, it yeah it was not for me but my husband loved it so every now and then he will go for a little float so he decided to treat himself to a little Christmas float as he is now officially finished working and I really do feel like that when he walks back through that door it will start to feel Christmassy finally <laughs> I'm hoping that doing some wrapping tonight will also help to help towards that and I also need to um make the cookies for tomorrow. I just found out that my nephew has been making um, shortbread stars, so I don't need to make sugar cookies. So I was gonna do sugar cookies and gingerbread, but I'm just gonna do gingerbread now. So I think I'm gonna have to make the dough tonight and then bake them in the morning, because they do need to be. Yes, mommy. So yeah, I think I'm gonna make the dough tonight whilst I'm cooking when the kids are in bed. It's nice to kind of do it together, but it's also like, can we be honest? Oh, I just love baking with my children. It's even stressful baking with children, I'm sorry. Can we all just start being honest with each other? <laughs> to be fair, yesterday, 
was all right it's because i didn't really care about the thing we were making it was just an activity but i do care tonight and i want to enjoy the making of the gingerbread dough so i'm gonna do um like gingerbread by candlelight do you need me to open your banana <laughs> i'm strong <laughs> my pilates is working yeah so baking by candlelight is on the agenda tonight which i think may be lovely I've also had a glass of wine, which is definitely helping. <laughs> so, um, I just wanted to come back to um, my kind of Q&A that isn't really a Q&A because I don't have the cues, but we um, kind of covered the designing stuff earlier and now I want to cover the autism stuff. I know this isn't going to affect all of you, but I do also know that there are a lot of you out there that, does affect, that this does affect as well. And I think... The main questions I got were about how I deal with the kids and my autism, how I'm feeling about it and how I kind of discovered it and like diagnosis and stuff. So I'm going to start by saying I am not officially diagnosed yet, but I'm on the list. <laughs> it's years, the waiting list in the UK. The process in the UK is that you speak to your GP. I had a phone call with him, like just a, sh a quick phone call and then I did a questionnaire and if you score like a certain amount in that questionnaire, then you have another little chat and then they refer you to be assessed. Now, let's just say I aced that test. <laughs> I scored like super high. And I had done a couple of online tests beforehand. And the really interesting thing was when I first did an online test, I kind of scored like you probably have autism. But then I did it again with my husband and so many of the questions were, I was like, I don't do that. No, I don't do that. And he was like, are you joking? You do that all the time. <laughs> so I definitely say if it's something you want to kind of look into, then to go through these kind of preliminary questionnaires with people who know you well, or like family, loved ones, friends, whoever's kind of, you would say, knows you, it's always good to do that because you don't see so much of it in yourself. If you could see it in yourself, you probably would have, you know, been more aware of it at a younger age. Um, so after I'd done that questionnaire, I had another chat with my um, doctor and he covered things like my ability to hold down a job I've never been in a job for more than a year two max and they would it would usually end in like um, me quitting or like it just breaking down and that kind of thing they asked about other mental health issues I've had numerous eating disorders I've got like general like anxiety and I don't feel like I have depression because I I know about depression and it sounds something that's a, a much bigger thing than what I feel. I have ups and downs, I have highs and lows, but I wouldn't say I've ever been truly depressed. I might have been, I just don't know enough about it, but I'd say overall it would probably a no, but I do struggle with anxiety for sure. Um, and then, yeah, basically we talked about like social things, communication things. And he said, yes, I think you should be assessed. So I'm on the list, it takes a long time, but while I'm waiting on the list, I do have access to support and care if I need it. It's all done through a charity in my, I think it's a charity or it's a, a foundation or a trust or something in my, my nearest city, which is Coventry. So I'm just waiting for that really. But to be honest, I don't, I don't need a diagnosis to to confirm that I'm autistic because it's just it's so obvious to me now speaking to lots of people with diagnosed autism lots of adults talking to my family about my childhood and how they perceived me and how I felt and the things that I did and the things that I went through in like ch child years teenage years early 20s everything so much of me that I didn't understand makes sense now and it's been truly truly liberating it's really hard the hardest thing about realizing I was autistic was um and I was warned of this by a very very nice person on Instagram saying I know you feel amazing right now but just be careful for the drop and when I like be aware of the drop and I had the drop and um possibly my first suicidal thought let's be honest and it was just like I'm never going to escape this like throughout my whole life it was always like well I'll just get thinner I'll just get a better job I'll just find you know a, 
a better partner or I'll you know I'll have more kids or there, there was always something that was gonna cure me of this thing and realizing that that is never gonna happen was hard but it was a sh it didn't last very long and I'm glad I was prepared for it so if you are embarking on this journey I would be aware of that and just you know be open speak to your loved ones don't don't sh like hide how you're feeling because it never helps so that's kind of where it started for me. This was all in like January of this year, by the way. Um, and so how am I feeling about it now? I, it's like, <laughs> I have good days and bad days. Um, I have days where I like feel like I can, I'm finally in control of my life, that I'm, you know, I've, I feel like I'm handling it. I feel like I'm coping. And I have days where I feel like the world is gonna end. And I mean, when I'm diagnosed, I, I don't know what, like, I don't know because the autism spectrum covers a lot of things it's not just autism it's ADHD it's OCD it's bipolar it's lots of different things are all on one big um spectrum that the like the umbrella turn is autism syndrome spectrum so it's it's not like you've got a little bit autistic and very autistic it's not a scale it's a spectrum it's very different for lots of different people and things that i struggle with i've learned this like for me i cannot stand to be touched especially by strangers and people uh, even sometimes people i know i'm just like no but i do know some people who like they thrive on it they're very tactile they need to be touched they like to be touched they like to touch so it's it you can really be lots of um different <laughs> there are so many ways to be on the spectrum are you doing it? well done darling good girl getting your jammy son oh there she is there she is so now this one has joined us yes how do i huh yes I think the question was, how do I um, not be constantly Mommy, overwhelmed by the kids? These are right there, because these are mine. They're mummies and daddies. Is that mine? That's mummies. Oh, no, it's mine. It's mummies. I think the question was something like, how do you not constantly get overwhelmed by the kids? And the honest answer is, I don't. I'm always overwhelmed by the kids to some level. <laughs> And for me, the best way I found to deal with it and to stop me getting to breaking point, and by breaking point, I mean shouty mummy. Um, I the best way I found is to learn how to um, recognise your triggers. So for me, nine times out of ten, it's sound and space. The things that get me the most are when they're being loud, when there's multiple different sounds, and when they're climbing on me. Like if my children need a cuddle or comfort or affection or assurance then yes that's fine but when i'm sitting and trying to do something and out of nowhere somewhere climbs up someone climbs on me that for me is very very triggering so if that's happening a lot penny's being needy if they're just being loud in general that's when i really really struggle so using earplugs or noise cancelling headphones is a big big one for me asking the kids for space explaining to them has been a big thing obviously if you've got really little children that doesn't help but giving the kids enough respect to let them into my world and to teach them what i need as much as what they need and that's usually go it's better with jeff penny doesn't get it yet but jeff does and that's right jeff I'd love to have a cuddle with you. Yes, please, let's have a cuddle. But can you please not climb on me? Mummy needs a little bit of space today. Mummy's feeling a bit sad. Mummy's feeling a bit anxious. I tend to say nervous because I don't think he quite understands what anxious is. But like, mummy's feeling a bit nervous today. Um, I need a little bit of space. And just, you know, like levelling with him, being honest with him can definitely help. And I definitely get a response from him. With Penny, it's, it has to be a lot simpler. It's usually distraction. It's like, oh, do you want to play with this? Do you want to do that? Do you want to go over here? Do you want to, like... And that can be hard because sometimes I just want to shout, leave me alone. <laughs> and I'm not saying I've never done that, but I'm trying to avoid doing that because I don't... I, I, I don't want them to feel rejected by their own parent. So it's hard, it's really, really hard, and I'm constantly trying to find the level, and it's constantly changing because they grow and they change. So the answer is I'm always overwhelmed by my kids. I'm just better at coping with it some days than others. <sighs> so if you have any questions,
about my kind of autism journey <laughs> please feel free to answer below please feel free to share your stories I find it very comforting comforting to read your stories I can't always reply to them because I don't have the social capacity to reply to every single story that is shared with me but please be assured that I read it and I appreciate it and it helps me so much and I know that sometimes it's just helpful to say it out loud so I hope it's helpful for you too so I think that brings us to the end of this little weird like Q&A thing that isn't really a Q&A sorry I think I'm going to close this vlog here because got stuff to do this evening let's be honest but you are going to be treated to some hopefully some nice candlelit footage of me making gingerbread though I'm not going to be rolling out and cutting it tonight so it'll just be me making the dough <laughs> and we're going to need to wrap some presents today because tomorrow is Christmas Eve and we are going to um, our family Christmas Eve party at my sister's house this year. Tomorrow morning I've got to go to the butchers and I've got to go to the baker. We don't have a candlestick maker in my village but the flower shop does sell candles <laughs> so maybe I'll be traditional and go buy a candle as well. <laughs> but yes I've got to go to the butchers to pick up our Christmas cockerel. We love to have the Christmas cock every year to much hilarity <laughs> and then I've got to pick up the bits from the baker that I'm taking to the party mainly a big load of focaccia because everybody loves it and then it will just be hopefully a quiet morning of a little bit of cleaning and tidying I want to spend some time like getting ready doing my hair and some knitting because I ain't finishing that sleeve by Christmas day no chance unless I spend like five hours on it tonight which is not a good idea. <laughs> so, I hope you enjoyed this episode. You, I've got, I'm on a bit of a roll now. I've got like three or four in a row to finish out Vlogmas. Um, I hope you enjoyed today's episode and I will see you tomorrow for Christmas Eve. Last year I combined Christmas Eve and Christmas Day together in one vlog which I posted on Boxing Day. I don't know how it's going to go this year because we are going to see my husband's family on Boxing Day this year so I don't know when it will be posted. I might try and get the Christmas Eve one up at some point I think because last year my dad stayed the night on Christmas Eve it wasn't appropriate to sit and edit and I didn't want to I don't want to do it in the morning either but he's not joining us till mid-morning on Christmas Day so I might have a little bit of time to edit Christmas Eve and upload it so you can have a little watch on Christmas Day when you're sick of your family but I hope you had a lovely day I hope you're feeling Christmassy I really really do and if you're not feeling Christmassy it's all right listen to your needs don't force yourself to be festive there are more important things like your mental health <laughs> so with that I wish you a good evening a Merry Christmas and I will see you tomorrow good night I need a cocktail Christmas lights fill the city There are people everywhere The snow is falling white and pretty As I stroll on my way to you How will you feel about No